Uh, welcome to the question and answer web webinar on guidelines for yoga posture. Uh, this is the final part of our five-part yoga for people in pain webinar series that's been co-sponsored by Pain BC. Today we'll be discussing your experiences and questions about the guidelines for yoga posture practice that we had posted and that you've been practicing this week. My name is Tanya and I'll be moderating the webinar today. I'm the project manager with the Canadian Institute for the Relief of Pain and Disability. This webinar is co-sponsored by CIRPD, ourselves, and Pain BC, in collaboration with the Canadian Pain Coalition. It's also made possible through the support of the Direct Access Grant through the BC government. As I mentioned, my name is Tanya, and I'll be moderating and helping with handling the question and answer session today. And we also have online Lisa Mighton, our education coordinator, and she'll be helping to moderate the questions. And our presenter today is Neil Pearson. Neil is a clinical assistant professor at UBC. He's a board member of Pain BC, founding chair of the Canadian Physiotherapy Pain Science Division, a physiotherapist, a yoga therapist, and creator of the Pain Care Yoga Certification. And I'd like to hand it over to him now to do uh, the presentation. Thank you very much, Tanya, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we had a bright, sunny day here in Penticton, and uh, some amazing uh, questions and comments that we get to uh, talk about today um, after people have tried this practice. And I must say, I'm, I'm so pleased to, uh, after reading these, it's, it's obvious that people have been trying these and, and being mindful and trying to integrate uh, the things we've been talking about. So the way we're going to run today is the way we've been running the, uh, the other webinars. We'll start with um, uh, some comments that we've got and some questions that we've uh, received about uh, this uh, sort of gentle yoga uh, practice and the guidelines. And um, we may have some time at the end to talk more about safety. I know there's a couple questions that have to do with safety with this one, so we'll get to those. And uh, if um, once we have time for questions, if any of you do have questions about um, safety or about uh, any research-related things, we can try to tackle those as best as we can. We have a lot of comments and questions, so I'll do my best to uh, move through them. So here we see the uh, two two boys here on the slides. So let's tackle the first one. The first one says, this was wonderful. I felt very relaxed. I'm a professional and don't have chronic pain, but I could move to my own tolerance and feel very good doing so. Uh, it echoed what I've learned as a facilitator in the chronic pain self-management program from uh, UVic. Uh, so yes, this, this information is very much in line with uh, the uh, other education that we uh, are providing to people who have chronic pain. Um, and a lot of people say sort of similar to what this person has said is that even though you know chronic pain is not a big big issue, uh, by doing it this way, it can actually feel more relaxing, more uh, more uh, calming to uh, practice yoga this way, and, and certainly using the kinds of guidelines that we talked about here and that you're playing around with, uh, we would hope would be preventative. We don't have any evidence around that, uh, but the big question uh, has been like, how do we prevent injury from happening in yoga? Because it does happen, and uh, really it seems that uh, if we can get people to pay more attention to their body and more attention to their breath and keep things calm, then that uh, should help out. Of course, that's important for uh, some of the comments we've got here as well today is, is how do I make sure that I, you know, I've got this one injury, how do I make sure that I don't injure something else or injure this problem even more by doing uh, yoga postures? That's really the, the point of the guidelines. So we move on to the second one. I think that there are signs uh, that they may be helping, but it, it is not a bad backache that I have. And so the improvements is hard to feel with certainty. So I was thinking when this person wrote this, they're either saying they don't have a backache or they don't have a bad backache. I wasn't quite sure which. Um, but uh, I think the gist of it is that uh, it may not be really easy to tell if you're getting any benefit from it. And so the, the first sort of step of knowing you've succeeded is that you are able to do the practice uh, without ending up staying worse when you're done. Uh, the second thing would be to look at uh, can you do the practice and actually feel uh, calmer or more relaxed when you're done, that would be great. Um, and for a lot of us, when we first start doing it, uh, we don't feel a big change in the pain right away. Uh, the change in the pain that we're going to get from doing this kind of practice will happen once we're actually able to move with more ease, then that, that decrease in pain and the, the better movement will follow along. 
So let's get on to some of the other comments we got. Uh, this one's great. The person says, I experienced segmented edges. Um, I had uh, different edges for different body sites within the same, very same movement. For example, with side twist, uh, my neck hurts, uh, sorry, neck would hurt, yet back would feel better. I find the awareness of calm breathing and relaxed body tension helpful, uh, needed to monitor these as well as the pain. So if we go to the, the first uh, point of this is, is finding these segmented edges uh, or the idea that uh, it's never so easy. Uh, you know, it's just never so easy. One of my, my students yesterday in class said, well, that's easier said than done, and that's exactly true. You know, even these guidelines, they sort of make things, attempt to make things a little bit easier, uh, but it's, it's definitely easier said than done. When you're in the face of having pain in more than one part of your body, or injury in more than one part of your body, and so uh, it requires uh, even sort of greater attention to be able to pay attention the right way to more than one part of your body. So this person, uh, they did the side twist, um, the neck hurts, but the back felt better. And so we, we need to say, how do we find the right balance between these two? If you're doing it to try to get your back to feel better, perfect. Uh, but we need to uh, modify things so that you don't end up having more pain in your neck. So this person was saying their neck hurt here. It's possible that it hurt worse when they did it, so we definitely want to modify it. Or they may say, you know, I did it, my neck pain really didn't change, uh, but my back felt better. And in that case, we wouldn't need to modify it quite so much. And this, uh, this idea of uh, needing to monitor these things, the awareness and calm breath is so, so important. It takes a lot of practice. And this is one of the big stumbling blocks for people is, there's so many things to pay attention to here. Uh, we're asking you to pay attention to the movements, but pay attention to your breath, pay attention to your body, pay attention to the pain, um, and then add on that, paying attention to more than one part of your body, and the tension in more than one part of your body becomes, uh, as you see, more complex. And so it may take more time, in that case, to uh, get some positive benefit. So the next comment uh, says, I really liked the introduction with the reminders and questions for this exercise. This should have been obvious to me. Um, it's so useful as a guide. It also made it clear to me that I actually have some control over changing my pain perception. Uh, never thought of this, thought of it this way, and this gives me hope. Uh, I'm so happy to hear that because that's one of the big, big key things that uh, um, I think is important in pain care. Um, and uh, just as, as an aside, in, in uh, this month's Chatelaine magazine, there's an article about chronic pain. And they, they interviewed me and, and uh, uh, quite extensively. But one point that they, they put in there that I said was uh, this idea about there is hope. We need to do things to find things to uh, uh, get people to understand that. Even in the face of the horrible nature of pain, we need to find some hope around this. So great. I'm so happy you uh, experienced it and, and shared that. If we go back to the other things, though, the person saying, um, that uh, these guidelines uh, should have been obvious, right? This information should have been obvious. And, and uh, that's exactly how I felt when I started to uh, understand this better, when I started to, uh, you know, when enough people had told me that this was the kind of thing that worked for them. Um, so I think some of you would have heard that I said, that, you know, I, we didn't get this out of a book. We got this by sort of understanding uh, the way the pain system works, but more so by listening to people who had pain and were succeeding and getting less pain and better function. And they sort of put this together for us. When, when, uh, when we sort of got it together, then it seemed like, oh my god, I can't believe we didn't actually understand this before. Because it, it does seem so obvious once you're there. Um, and this other point that the person said here is, uh, uh, it also made it clear to me that I actually have some control. And that's another big, big part of this, is that um, I think this is one of the benefits of doing yoga postures is uh, if we can find a way to do it, uh, find a way to do the physical practice of yoga or any activity that's mindful, and, and by doing it in the right way, start to realize that we do have more control over the pain and do have more control over our movements. Uh, just that sense of control is a huge, huge thing for, for many of us when you have chronic pain. And when we start to realize, hey, you know, there actually is something I can control, we know then that sort of goes back into your physiology and your brain will start to engage the parts of your, the parts of your brain that help you with, with pain control. Um, so uh, uh, there are four parts of our brain, there are four processes in our brain that we know of that help with pain control. And we know that when you have that sense of control, 
uh, those parts of your brain will become more accessed. So that's a, a wonderful positive thing here. So thanks again for that comment. Uh, this one, next one says, I'm really enjoying the part where we're sitting and experiencing the feeling of lightness. When I did this lying down in the past, it sometimes translated into a feeling of tension, whereas doing it sitting up makes me realize I've been slumping in my upper back in an attempt to relax and not to be uptight. Uh, then the feeling of spreading warmth provides further relaxation. So at the end of the practice, with the idea of trying to feel a sense of lightness in your body, uh, it's, it's another breathing tech we can, technique we can do. Um, and uh, one of the benefits this person, I'm sure, would have had is this, like, this, this, once again, this feeling like, wow, you know, I, actually, I can actually change the way my body feels by thinking about it and by breathing at the same time. Um, and that's, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a while to get there for, for us when we practice. But when you get there, once again, that gives you more of a sense of control. And that's a really, really key point is uh, you know, once we start to do these things, we realize we can change things more than we thought. And that really opens the door to us to be able to do more. Um, so uh, thanks again for sharing that one. So I think Tanya and Lisa, let's uh, see if there's any questions or comments that are coming in. There's one um, for this category, and she's saying it's really hard not to catch and hold um, your your breath. She thinks it's because her pain is worse on inhaling. And if you have any suggestions or thoughts on that. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of different things that we can do with this. Uh, first of all, you can change the way, change around the way that you're. Uh, moving and breathing. So um, whether you breathe in while you're moving or maybe you breathe in first and then you breathe out as you move, that's another option. So if you do find that it's, it's hard not to have your breath catch and hold it while you breathe in, then what you might want to do is breathe in first and as you breathe out then do the movement and then as you breathe back in again try to release the movement and maybe that might soften it up for you to see if that will work better. Uh, the holding of our breath or casting our breath is absolutely a, a protection response. It's sort of this, uh, like an old reflex that we have. Whereas if you if you move towards something with pain or if you even think about moving towards something with pain sometimes, we hold our breath. And on top of that, we typically hold our breath when we do something new. And now we know that, that holding your breath will tend to agitate the system and I'm sure the person who asked this knows or has experienced that. So we want to try to find a way to uh, diminish that. And so if you're doing your best not to hold your breath, doing your best not to feel like your breath catches, but it keeps on happening, what I would ask you to do is, is keep on trying. So when you do the movement, uh, really try to go to sort of a soft edge, to a place where there's really not that much increase in pain. If you do that, you'll be more likely to be able to succeed, to succeed at not holding your breath and then just keep on doing it over and over and with enough practice it's it's one of those skills that that you should be able to get um, and once again it, this would be one of these places if if you're trying all that stuff and it's still not working then this is where you really want to try to find some some practitioner a, a health professional or a yoga therapist who might be able to help you out with with uh, other um, other techniques that would help stop this from happening because it really can't be a big stumbling block for a lot of people. There's one question. I'm not totally sure if it's for this category, but I'm going to try this now. She says, this is Sharon, and she says, I, I liked this week's practice very much. Is there a way really of taking it further? Is there an online resource for practicing other moves and postures? She says, I've taken yoga before I had chronic pain, and those sorts of classes aren't suit suitable for me at this time. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Sharon. Um, uh, and right now, we don't have uh, those resources. Um, we're actually, uh, um, as we've been going through this and seeing that there's so much interest in this sort of thing, wondering, you know, how can we take it further? Can we find a way to get the resources to be able to take that further here? The only thing that I know of that's out there uh, right now would be things that you do have to pay for, first of all. Um, you know, yoga DVDs aren't all that expensive, and now that there are some sites on the, on the internet where you can download them, which makes them even less. Uh, but what you'd really be looking for is something where it's really gentle. Uh, and I wish I could tell you that all the all of the gentle yoga DVDs are really gentle, but they're they're not all really all that gentle. Uh, but that would be the place to try to go is look for look for other resources like that. 
uh, if you if you think uh, Tai Chi would be something that would suit you or you think something like Qigong would, would help you um, there are also uh, DVDs out there where you can do those movements uh, they're often very very gentle movements uh, especially in Tai Chi so I, I, that's um, all I can think to offer you uh, at this point that's all the questions at this moment okay well let's carry on I think there's actually a cool question further a little bit about that but uh, so these next two we'll go with the first one it says uh, uh, we'd like to know if there are kinds of pain in which yoga postures are not able to help um, definitely there's going to be some kinds of pain um, you know for people who have um, pain from uh, cancer or other uh, neurological injuries it's going to be hard for these to help. I think you probably can imagine if someone's had a stroke and they have uh, a pain from the stroke, um, the yoga postures are going to uh, uh, maybe not be as beneficial and this person would definitely need some guidance with it if that was the case. Um, but I know there's got to be, there's got to be, because I don't like, you know, absolutes don't seem to make a lot of sense, so there's got to be some pain conditions in which it won't help. I think there are definitely some pain conditions in which there's going to uh, it, it will require a lot of modification and a lot of one-on-one -on -one work. I'm thinking of the, the patients that I have who have um, complex regional pain syndrome or people who might have pain from, a, from an injury of their central nervous system. I think it's going to be much harder to uh, find a way to do yoga postures for these things without the postures making actual postures seeming to increase the pain. So we need to do a lot of modifications. So. The yoga postures are there to help with the pain from so many different aspects. Typically we think if, you know, we have pain so we get stiff and if I could just be more flexible I'd have less pain and, and that may be the case or we, we have pain and we get less active and so we lose strength and we think if I could just be stronger I'd have less pain and there's definitely some research that says that when people start um, getting stronger in the face of chronic pain that their pain typically gets better too. So there's very physical things, but um, because doing yoga postures, because moving your body affects more than just the physical you, it affects the sort of mental and emotional and spiritual you, um, there are benefits that we get from what happens there. If, if you are uh, doing the yoga posture and, and you can finally feel some sense of control, you can get some benefit in terms of pretty much any kind of pain from that. Um, if you're doing the yoga posture and you're feeling uh, stronger again, not just that your body feels stronger, but your sense of yourself is that you more, have more strength and more vitality, that typically kind of, those things typically help with uh, going into the pain. Or if it makes you less anxious or makes you feel happier or makes you uh, create, by doing it, it creates a greater sense of peace, we can get all the benefits from there. So there's, there's so many different aspects of yoga that can help us with, with pain. Um, but as I said, I think there would be, and, and I can't think of any, many, many of them off, off the top of my head, but I know there's got to be some, some things where uh, the pain is not going to be better from the yoga posture. There's just one other thing to mention on this is there are very specific illnesses um, or diseases or injuries to the body where there will be yoga postures where you absolutely would not want to do that. So say you had... Um, rheumatoid arthritis that had extended, you know, it had been there long enough and it had actually changed your neck and created instability in your neck. There's a whole bunch of neck uh, movements that you would not want to do. Or if you had osteoporosis that was quite advanced, there's a whole lot of yoga postures that do not make sense uh, in the face of those kinds of injuries. And that's where uh, so many of us will need some guidance. Uh, and, and I hope that you'll be able to find guidance from someone who both understands the, the health side um, of your uh, condition um, and someone who understands yoga because um, you know there's so many different kinds of yoga and just actually yesterday I met someone who's just uh, finishing up surgery and, and chemotherapy after cancer and, and she was saying that uh, uh, she had been re recommended by a healthcare professional not to do yoga um, and uh, she realized that the person saying that didn't uh, really know yoga all that much um, didn't realize that you can modify things as much. She's done yoga before, so she knows that. So, hence coming back to me and figuring out how we can do it without, you know, with, with taking care of the medical issue, as well as getting her back to doing something she likes. 
Next question is, uh, can one use these guidelines for pain, uh, pain in the knee? Absolutely. You can use these guidelines, uh, the guidelines of, um, is this really dangerous? Will I pay for it later? Um, and uh, monitor your, your breath and your, your body tension and the pain. You can use these guidelines for any condition whatsoever. Um, and uh, you know, pain in the knee could be from so many different things. It could be osteoarthritis. It could be from a, a, a torn meniscus or injured ligaments or so many different things. But regardless of the, of the, the condition, uh, if you still uh, if you follow these guidelines, you're more likely to be able to do the yoga postures in a way that won't kick up the pain. And if you're able to persist with them, uh, that won't uh, worsen it. Um, and definitely around the knee, you need to be careful in a lot of the, the yoga, um, the more general yoga classes, because you can put a lot of force on your knee with some of the, uh, uh, the squatting or the kneeling down. Um, can put a lot of force on your knee that we need to take care of. So the next question is, uh, is this dangerous? Will I pay for it later? How can you really know in advance? This is, off this is a great, great question, one that we get a lot. Uh, so for example here, when I do twists and side bends, uh, I can feel a sequential clicking down my spine. How do I know this is OK for my, ex for my experience? Or is, there a, uh, is this where I need to, the one-on-one -on -one with a practitioner? Now, it might be a place where you need the one-on-one -on -one with a practitioner. Uh, it, it, you can imagine it's so hard to know from here. However, what I would say is that the, to the first thing is you ask, um, how can you really know this in advance? So I believe that it's almost impossible for most of us to know this with pure clarity in advance. That's where the expertise of a health professional can help. But what we're looking for is that, that uh, if you're going to be doing these gentle movements, the first thing we want is that someone with some expertise has said to you, you know, it's, it actually is safe. You're not going to injure your back. Your back's not going to uh, be uh, damaged if you're doing these, these movements. So then the next step is, after you've heard that, the next step is to uh, ask yourself the question. And you may say, well, actually, I don't feel like it's safe to really push this. Um, and uh, you may say, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to pay for it later. And so this, once again, would be the time where what we'd ask you to do is start by you know, uh, finding that calm breath, finding the best calm body you can, and then move towards the position or do the movement really gently. And as soon as you feel an increase in the pain, then just you come on back out of it. Just go over there and try it a few times really gently. And you just have to continue to evaluate yourself. Um, it's the only way to know for certain. Um, if I've had a, a disc injury in my back and, and I, you know, I've been told it's okay to forward bend, um, how, you know, how would I know to, how far to go, how many to do, you know, is it really safe? Because you know, here we have this expert saying it is, and how do we know for sure? Uh, well, we don't. What we know is you, we want you to try to move into it gently, uh, to do your best to keep your breath and your body calm, and really to go with the, uh, uh, there is no way to know. but. Given that you're paying attention to pain, to your breath, and your body tension, now you've actually got three alarm systems to pay attention to rather than just one. So you're, now you've given your, by paying attention to these things, you're, you're actually giving your body uh, sort of triple alarm so that uh, it can tell you in a whole bunch of different ways uh, to back off, and, and typically it does. Um, we often wonder whether, as we're becoming more tolerant of the pain, whether our nervous system is as well, and, and typically it's not. What happens with ongoing pain is your, your pain system actually becomes wound up and more cranky. So it's, it's going to tend to tell you um, to back off way before you could cause damage to your back. And if you go back and you watch the, 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 the intro to this, this last session, uh, and uh, there was a, me trying to explain that there, how when you have pain it persists. Um, the alarms are going to go off uh, uh, further away from where you damage your body now. And so if you're just going up to that spot where the alarm is going off a little bit more, then you can be pretty much assured that you are uh, you are safe. Now the person here has mentioned about sequential clicking down the spine. And, and you know sometimes this is something that you uh, would want to take some care of and get some uh, professional uh, input on. Um, a lot of times, this clicking stuff that happens around our spine, we just don't know for certain. Um, and I know that uh, uh, 
a number of my patients have said that you know after a disc injury they've sort of got this spot in their back that if they move a certain way they get this really good click um, and it just seems seems to be something that that happens we don't know by the way the the, the clicking I'm just mentioning is is not just stuff that you can the person can can feel inside their body but sometimes if someone's standing beside them, the person beside them can actually hear it. So it's a fairly significant click that can happen. And uh, we, we think that most of those are not uh, dangerous. But you need that, that expertise to help you with that. So the next question is a little bit uh, similar to this. It's, uh, I'm nervous about lifting my neck to look up at the ceiling during the sitting cat-cow movement. I have uh, disc deterioration. I've been told by some physiotherapists not to extend the neck this way. Am I limiting myself by doing it, or is it sensible to avoid this motion in my case? I realize that you may not be able to comment given this limited information. Uh, well, I can't tell you exactly what to do, but I definitely can comment about it. Uh, the first thing I would say is that if your physiotherapist is, says, has told you that it's dangerous for you to look up, uh, then uh, that's probably true. Uh, what I would ask you to do is when you're talking to your physiotherapist uh, is to say, so uh, is there a, a distance of you know, in terms of look up. So should I look up? Should I not lift my chin up uh, at all, or should I just be careful of not putting up certain past a certain point? Because that's that's the thing that we need to understand is um, how far is it okay? Now, if the physiotherapist, whoever's working with you, can't tell you that for certain, then you can go back and try these guidelines. However, if your healthcare professional has said to you, you have this particular problem in your neck, and it would be dangerous for you to look up to you know to take your neck into a, a, a upward or back bending movement. Then I would suggest you really pay attention to that because there are this is one area of the, of the spine there with some injuries uh, that you could cause uh, fairly significant uh, injury to the this little artery that goes up through your spine. So you need to take care of it. So it, it's it's an odd this this thing about putting our neck up and looking up is odd because there are certain cases where uh, you do not want to push neck extension or neck back bending um, and in other cases where uh, it's it's okay if the person writing this or if you're listening to this and you're saying well I've got you know I've had an x-ray or something and it said that I've got some deterioration or, or degeneration of the disc in my spine if this is if this is the standard wear and tear stuff that happens in our neck, the likelihood of there being a significant risk from looking up is low. Uh, but if it's a you know a substantial uh, you know changes in your discs where your neck has actually changed in terms of stability, then it's it's something you really need to take more care of. So all that said, people may be going, well, I don't know what to do. So what I would suggest to you is this: is give it a try but only do it a very, very small amount. It's a little bit like doing circles with your neck. What often people do to feel safe, to know they're okay, is they roll their head forward and take it up to their shoulder, and then they, from one shoulder they just sort of side bend all the way over to the other shoulder, and they do their neck circles with sort of a flat bit at the back of the circle. Um, and people you know, do that sort of thing, and, and if they feel safe doing it, then they might try to do a little bit of a back bend. Um, and that's probably what we want to try to do is just Try a little bit. If you are concerned, though, have a talk with uh, your healthcare professional. And I'm sorry that's not perfectly clear, black and white, but it's not an area where we can give you that. Um, and it's an area where there is uh, there can be a significant risk. Anyway, so we'll go on to the next one here. Um, is there somewhere I would have access to similar lower body movements? I would like to go further with this. So uh, this is one of the things we've been considering. You know, we just gave you some very gentle uh, neck, shoulder, upper body movements with the uh, with the uh, webinar uh, video that we did. Right now, we don't have anything that's uh, easily accessible. This is also one of the things where you could turn to some of the the gentle uh, yoga and tai chi DVDs that are out there to try to get some some movements through there. Or if you do have back or or hip issues and you want to get to the lower body. I think you'd be able to find some of the yoga DVDs that are, you know, yoga for low back pain or yoga for hip issues, and these would would be doing uh, movements of those areas of the body. Sometimes in sitting, sometimes in laying, sometimes in standing, and then you could try to use these guidelines and the ones that, uh, you know, start with the ones that that feel safe when you look at them. 
But other than that, so we don't have anything else to get. So let's take another pause here, see if there's any other questions. Uh, two things. First, a uh, pat on the back. Um, Diana says, thank you, Neil. I absolutely love your meditation and gentle yoga DVD that I got from your website. So just passing that on. Okay. Um, and then a question from um, Mara. How do I find someone who can tell me what's safe? Um, and the context is that she has a cyst in her spinal cord. So how, how can I t find someone who can tell me what's safe? Wow. Um, you know, if I'm guessing if, if you have a cyst in your spinal cord, then some medical doctor has done a, an evaluation. So there's been a, uh, either an MRI or a CT scan or a uh, X-ray. Probably not so much an X-ray. You might be able to see it in the other ones. So that would be the first place to go is to go to the, uh, the, the, the doctor who was looking at those investigations and gave you the information. If the doctor is not certain in terms of what's safe in terms of movement for your back, I think that's where you really want to go out and find a, a physical therapist because that tends to be, you know, that, that's, that's where the movement specialist, that's, you know, we understand medical conditions and we understand how to get people moving. And, uh, you know, maybe what you end up having to do is to get the physical therapist and the doctor to talk together and the two of them together can come up with, uh, with the answer of what's safe. That's probably, that would be my suggestion of, of go that way. Did you get any other questions? Um, the one sort of from the a back category, someone saying, I fall asleep after trying any yoga on deep breathing. Is there a way to prevent this, or must I just plan to nap? <laughs> OK. Uh, well, there's so many different things about this. Is, um, and, and sorry, I'm, I'm not laughing at the problem. I'm laughing at the, uh, this is, it's so, so common. You know, when the pain is really bad, we end up being sleep deprived. And then we do anything that tries to take us through towards relaxation during the day. and we're snoring in no time at all, uh, but at the same time, just we're having a hard time sleeping at night. So if that happens, the first thing I would want you to do is get that alarm clock beside you to, uh, you know, if you think I'm going to try practicing this for 10 minutes or 15, whatever it is, uh, get the alarm clock beside you so that you do not continue to sleep, because if you start to nap too much in the day, you're going to disrupt your nighttime sleep even more, and you don't want to do that. Um, a lot of people, when they're starting to do any practices, whether they have pain or not, when we start to do uh, relaxation practices, we tend to fall asleep because that's what we've been doing all our life. You know, the, the one time we sort of practice uh, relaxing is on the way to sleep. And so now you're trying to relax and to find a way to be awake, and so it's really common for this, this to happen, the, the falling asleep. So what do you do? Get that alarm beside you, and that'll help. The second thing you'd want to do is when you get into doing this at first, uh, what you want to do is actually have a little conversation uh, with yourself that pretty much goes that um, my intention is to stay awake. So you're going to tell yourself right, that the whole point of doing this is to stay awake. And I'm going to do my very best to do it. Then you try to sort of hold on to that, go into the practice, and you'll probably find that the first you know, number of times you're going to fall asleep anyway. But if every time you do it, you say, you know, my intention is to stay awake. As long as you're not wildly sleep deprived, um, you uh, you should be able to get to the spot where you can learn how to stay awake while you're doing this. It, it is a learning thing. Now, if all that's not doing well, then what we need to do is we need to find a relaxation or meditation technique uh, that engages your brain enough um, that even though your body is starting to calm down, your brain is is actually uh, alert. Um, and this is where sometimes the, some of the biofeedback techniques can work, where you're looking at something on the screen and you're trying to control things on the screen. Um, then at the same time as your body is calming down uh, while you're doing this, your mind is engaged in this thing that you're doing, and so you can stay awake better. And that might be uh, what you'd want to look for. Um, there aren't that many uh, biofeedback things out there. Right now, most of them are are fairly expensive. There are some that you can get for you know, like $299, which is still pretty expensive. Um, but uh, uh, I can't think of any other ways to do that other than, I guess the last thing I would say is, once again, find someone who's experienced in helping people learn how to relax uh, and uh, get them to do some work with you one-on-one -on -one and see if they can help find the answer for you.
I think that's most of the questions for this category. Okay. All right, so a uh, bit of a safety question here. The instructions Neil uh, gives are applicable to a pain situation in which there is or has been tish tissue damage and pain may be increased by certain movements. I have chronic headache and while I, while I have tense sore neck shoulder and upper back muscles, I don't think my condition was caused by tissue damage and I don't really see a direct relationship between movement and my level of pain. I'm not sure how the instruction and explanation would apply in a case like mine. Uh, can you comment on this? Um, I think this is exactly right, is, is that there are differences that we need to look at in terms of pain. So there are some pain conditions that are caused by injury to the body and there are some in, uh, pain conditions that are caused by diseases that affect the physical body. And then there are those other pain conditions uh, that, can, that can come on from uh, problems in other systems. So there, uh, the headaches this person has, it could be a problem, you know, say with the vascular system, you know, like migraines, or it's possible that uh, headaches sometimes can be due to uh, shifts in other chemistry in our body, hormone, immune system. We don't really seem to understand fully about chronic headaches. That said, though, um, I've been surprised that sometimes when I'm educating people about this in big groups, uh, that uh, people will show up who have headaches, chronic headaches, or, or migraines. And I've heard this message a number of times from people is that they've, you know, they're, they're desperate to try something, so they go home and they they try this. Uh, calming their breath, and calming their body, and then starting to um, do those things while they're trying to move. And there's been uh, people who have come back and said, you know, uh, if uh, if I can do these sorts of things when the pain is just starting to build up, I can often prevent it from getting really bad. If the if the pain is really bad, these techniques don't work as well. Um, and uh, people have told me that they don't find that they stop the pain. Um, you know, at all times, what they can do is prevent it from getting worse. And I don't have a real good answer for this. Um, I can tell you that there are other things that are similar to this. There are people who have irritable bowel syndrome, and there's been some research that shows that when you get people who have irritable bowel syndrome, uh, which you, you can imagine is, is really, a, it's, it's a little bit like having a really cranky stomach and intestine where, where the food that we eat um, that uh, you know, in, in all of us would upset us to a certain extent. Uh, it takes very little of anything spicy or different, um, or too heavy or too fat or too much protein, um, and and this person starts to have this really quite horrible uh, pain and bloating through the bowel. So we've got this problem that's not specifically an injury to the body and it's not specifically to the mus muscles and skeleton. Uh, but there's some really great research to show that when people work on, on breathing and relaxation um, and when people do yoga practices that they find that their irritable bowel syndrome gets better. Now one thing that we don't know uh, is that it's possible that when people are starting to do the meditation and yoga when they have things like irritable bowel syndrome they might be also at, you know, saying okay I'm going to start to be, do something more healthy in terms of meditation yoga, but what they might also be doing is changing their diet as well. So we don't know for certain um, that that isn't part of the reason why they feel better, but we know when people start to do this that there are benefits that happen uh, in pain conditions that aren't specifically related to um, tissue disease or to injury. So the, uh, the, long, or the short answer would be uh, if you have pain that's not from an injury or uh, tissue disease, Give it a try anyway, see how it goes, because the research is suggesting that there are people who get significant benefit from this. Um, and uh, for, for the person who wrote this, um, if you have a headache and then it makes all the muscles through your shoulders and neck and upper back get really tight and tense, it's possible that that tension will then feed back into the pain of the headache and then actually you get a vicious cycle. So hopefully um, these sorts of practices, even though they might not change the sort of original headache, what they can do is take out some of the escalation of the pain that's happening uh, when your body gets really, really tense. And, and I'm sure when your body gets tense, your fight, fight systems get uh, even more agitated. So it can sort of help on the, the sort of secondary effects of the headache. Anyway, I hope that's uh, 
helped out with that. So a couple of other things that we've got here. One person says, my knees are hurting really badly when I'm in the kneeling position. Uh, can I do it in another position instead? Absolutely. Uh, what we want to do is, is for every uh, physical condition, try to modify the position. And definitely if you have uh, knee issues, then you probably want to avoid kneeling. Uh, for some sort of anatomical quirk, uh, I don't have any problems uh, kneeling on my knees, you know, even on hard surfaces, my knees are okay. But a lot of us, because of our anatomy, regardless of whether there's something wrong, uh, wrong inside the knee, uh, kneeling down is just uh, a difficult place to be. And obviously if you're, if you're kneeling and your knees are hurting, it's going to be really, really hard for you to keep your mind focused on what, you, what you're trying to uh, gain here, so you don't want to start there. So you could do some of the positions, uh, you know, some of the same movements of your body in sitting um, and laying down and you need to, uh, if you can't figure that out, then I think I can guarantee you that pretty much any yoga teacher around will be able to give you a lot of different uh, modifications that you can do so that doesn't happen. The other point related here says, can going to the edge worsen degenerative processes, say in the knees? So my belief is that if you are mindful and if you're going to the spot where the pain is just a little bit more, right, you're going to that spot where the pain is just a little bit louder, right? the alarm is just a little bit louder, and you're able to keep your breath and your body calm, I don't believe that you're going to worsen a degenerative process because I don't think you're going to be able to get to the spot where you're putting enough force on the tissue to cause uh, more degeneration. Um, and our hope is that by, by doing the movements at that place that's further away from where you would cause tissue harm, that the tissue will actually, even in the face of degenerative changes, that there will actually be, be uh, changes in the, in the tissues of your body that would allow you to be able to then um, be better, even in the face of degenerative changes. So uh, can going to the edge worsen degenerative processes? Not usually. Uh, I think the time that it does it, uh, if we go on the flip side, when can that happen? It happens when we take the tactic of uh, gritting our teeth, you know, just holding our breath and pushing through the pain. That's when we need to be worried about um, these things. And by the way, if your degenerative process happened to be something like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, what we'd want to do is make sure that uh, when you are in a flare-up, you're gonna your edge is going to be totally different than when you're not in a flare-up. Um, you know, when you're in a flare-up, you have to be so careful about how you're moving. But uh, if you're not in a flare-up, and if the joints that you're working around aren't in a big, uh, sorry, haven't become uh, really unstable due to, to, sorry, due to the degeneration that's happening along with the rheumatoid arthritis, um, then uh, you're okay to um, go to this edge still. And we want you to. We want you to. Uh, uh, don't just be guided by the pain in that case because the pain's not giving you accurate, or accurate enough information. Um, it's going to tell you to stop really quite soon. So that's why we want to work with this, the, the edge of where you can breathe, where you can keep your body calm, and where the, the pain stays low. And definitely if you have, if you have something like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, it's really, really valuable to talk to your healthcare professional, um, in this case probably your physical therapist or occupational therapist, about when you're not in a flare-up, uh, how you know how sh how hard should you, you be pushing these joints, or how gentle should you be? Uh, because you, uh, we often tend to back off more than uh, more than that's best in terms of trying to make the make some uh, sort of re regain some things when we're not in the flare. But talk to your healthcare professional about that if you have RA, because it's important. So let's go back to the audience. Any further things? Uh, I'm just going to pass on a little more. Per a little more praise because I think it might be useful to, other, to others. Ron says, as a result of these webinar videos, I am now able to resolve pain causing tension, not only during home practice sessions, but also during my daily walk. I am now able to actually feel tension developing in my hips during a walk and can go to a place in my mind that helps dissipate this tension. The result is less pain and potential damage in this area. I thank you, Neil, for this. Thank you for saying that, Ron. That's uh, that's fantastic. I mean, when it works like this, it I think, or I hope, what it does is actually gets people to realize that there is hope. Um, it doesn't always happen as fast as this happened with you, uh, 
Um, and often when people say things like this to me, it, it, it's uh, when I start talking to them, it, it turns out that they've been working on some, some wise things before this. Uh, so you, you, know, you sort of prepared yourself for this kind of thing. Uh, but uh, it definitely shows that it's possible. Even in the face of, of uh, big, long-lasting pain, uh, there's still a chance we can change it. So thanks for sharing that, Ron. I think that's most of the questions. We've got one section left, am I right? I am out of comments and questions from my end. And we have about 10 minutes left. So maybe we'll pop it back to the people who are on. Uh, if there are any other questions or comments you want to toss in, please do that. Okay. Hey Lisa, I think you might be muted. I can hear you in the other room, but I can't hear you. I sometimes hear about a two-hour rule that if pain is worse two hours after exercising, then I should cut back. Would you agree with this? Oh, great, great point. Uh, uh, and if I just were to, if you only you know give me the option of saying yes or no, I would say I do not agree with that. However, um, it may actually be exactly the right rule for an individual. So what we want to do is is um, the very first thing is look at if we're going to start to try to move more, try to exercise more, to recover more function and ease of movement, uh, what we want is that after we do the exercise activity or movement, that we're feeling like the benefits of what we have just done outweigh the consequences. So if someone were to say to me that their pain is worse for two hours afterwards, I would say, well, do you think that's okay? Do you think that the benefit you're getting from doing the activity it weighs the fact that you've now had two hours of increased pain. And some people will say, absolutely, it's okay. You know, if I, if I do it and the pain only stays bad for two hours, this is that, you know, that's fantastic. And I know that, that this is going to be good for me in the end. Whereas other people will say, no, I'm not, I'm not prepared to have that increase in pain yet. Or where the increase in pain is, is uh, uh, you know, it, it's worse for two hours, but then it, it sort of lingers and it, it, I stay sort of agitated afterwards. So I think we want to try to, as best we can, um, stay away from uh, guidelines that are, are like that and, and try to think of them in, in sort of a, a bigger sense of what are we trying to do here. It's a little bit like sometimes people say that um, when you're doing exercise, uh, if, you, if you rate your pain on a 0 to 10 scale, that while you're doing your, your exercise, the pain shouldn't get more than two points more intense while you're doing the exercise. Now, there's some wisdom to this. This is the, you know, people saying, okay, well, you don't want the pain to get, you know, it's okay to have some increased pain, but we don't want the pain to get too, too high. Uh, but the problem is it's, it's individual. As some people may, you know, if, if, I'm, uh, if my pain is, say, an 8 or a 10, um, and it's going up to a, a 10, uh, that's probably not acceptable. If the pain is a, a 5 going up to a 7, well, it might be more acceptable. If the pain is a 1 going up to a 3, I'm probably saying, well, that's, that's perfectly fine. And so because these scales are so individual, uh, we want to look at these guidelines and then try to make, make them uh, have the most sense to where we are and what we're doing. Um, so if your pain's worse for more than two hours or for two hours afterwards, ask yourself, do I think that I'm still getting benefit from this? And if you are, and the, you're not making the pain scream all the time when you're, when you're doing the activity, then I'd say this is probably okay. Okay, there are a few more questions now. One of them is about safety and a specific pose. She says, every time I do child's pose, curling my back to reach forward, I'm strained for three to four days in my lower back. It gets difficult to roll over, etc. This has happened three times, even though I'm being very careful and not straining or reaching for too long. Any suggestions? From Catherine. Oh, uh, yeah, Catherine, this is great. So uh, my very first suggestion would be is uh, don't go as far into that posture. Um, it would probably be the, the easiest thing to do. It might be the, the length of time that you're in the posture that's in trouble, but what I would do first off is, is uh, see if I could like, put something under where my head is going to go or even um, stack my hands. Sometimes people put their hands in sort of gentle fists, one on top of the other, and then put their forehead on top of the, 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 the top of the two hands so that you're not sinking down as far. Or putting um, 
cushions, pillows, blankets, something underneath your shoulders and chest when you come down so you don't go as deep into the posture. As much as it's important to modify the position, the other thing that you can do is go back and see when you're in the posture, uh, how, what's happening in the other aspects of you. So are you keeping your breath calm while you're there? Because that might be part of the problem. Uh, you know, say your back's feeling strained, that may be going on. Um, it's possible that while you're there, because it's always hurt before, that your mind's in this, uh, oh, this is a bad idea, I shouldn't be here every time I do this, it's going to make my pain worse. And if that's happening, what we need to do is try to find a way to make that less, because that all by itself could really, really crank up an already cranky nervous system. So the problem's from your back, but if you're, if you're if your systems have learned this is a bad idea, they may sort of turn on all the protection while you're there. So you'd want to be either find a way to uh, calm those thoughts down, or what you do is you position yourself in a place where those thoughts are common. Some people will say, you know, I'm in a place the pain doesn't feel too bad. I can keep my breath calm and I keep my body calm, and yet the pain still gets worse. Sometimes uh, it's because of the the agitation that can happen from from these, the, the mental process, right? which is really brain activity. If the brain is really getting agitated and the fight flight system in your body is getting agitated, even though you're trying to calm things down, that could lead you to be worse. So modify the position a bit. Check to see if you can still breathe calmly. Check to see if you can keep your body tension low. But also make sure you check to see that your, your thoughts and your emotions are in a more calm state. Um, and if they're not, just keep on backing out of that posture to a spot where you can can feel that um, and then go from there. Now there's quite a few questions about yoga and safe <laughs> safety. This one might apply to more people. Is there any way I could do the exercises? Because of back pain, I cannot do them sitting down. Any alternative? Can I do them laying down? I have been on bed rest for three years and have not done any activities, let alone exercise. So, okay, so if you've been on bed rest for three years, uh, then I think this is, this is where you need someone to come in and, and actually give you the guides in terms of how you move. So get you to move, get someone to watch you while you're doing it. They can give you the feedback of how you're breathing and such. Um, I, unfortunately, that's going to have some expense, um, and hopefully you can get that. That would be the best way. If you have been on bed rest for three years and you want to start moving at this, I would suggest that what you do is um, start with visualization or imagery. So rather than starting to do a lot of movements by moving your body around, what I would do is is get you to watch a, a yoga DVD and you know see what they're doing and then close your eyes and imagine yourself trying to do that sort of a movement. Uh, maybe you can't fully imagine it, but try you know try to imagine yourself doing some of those movements because when you do that, you're going to engage your nervous system, and so you're going to sort of prep your nervous system to be ready. Whereas if after you know three years of, of being in bed, your nervous system is going to probably be on a bit of a vigilant state, and your body is, is going to not be all that tolerant of movement yet. So if you can prep your nervous system first, and then move in to start doing some gentle movements, and certainly you can do um, modify the movements from laying down. Um, you know, we need to find uh, videos or, or things that you can watch to provide that. Uh, but it's the beauty of, of yoga is that you can modify it. Um, so that you can do do it from a wheelchair, you can do it from laying down, you can do it from standing. Uh, we just have to figure out how to individualize it for you. Um, this one sort of about a, a particular, a specific posture requests. Um, she says, I have shooting pain traveling on the outside of both legs from the feet up to the hips, have trouble walking. Is there a yoga position, do you think, that will help this from Pearl? Gosh, Pearl, I wish I could. Uh, uh, this is one of the questions that uh, I know I can't really help all that well. Um, and what we, you know, really need to be able to do is is know what the diagnosis is, or be able to work with you one on one to be able to see. Because there's so many reasons you know, that that the pain in your leg, the shooting stuff. I I don't know whether it would be from your back or from your feet. Um, so I really, uh, I apologize, I really am not sure how to give you any good guidance other than see if you can find um, a healthcare professional who can guide you on that. From Debbie, do you have any thoughts on carpal tunnel syndrome and yoga? Uh, I got lots of thoughts on that. Um, there's actually been uh, some 
some research showing that when people with carpal tunnel syndrome start to do it, that they get better. Uh, now they're going to have to change what you're doing because you don't want to, if you're, you know, yoga and you, you know about sun salutations, that's not where you want to go uh, right off the bat when you have carpal tunnel syndrome. So you wouldn't want to jump right into the postures that require you to be, say, on your hands and knees with your wrists really pulled back or, or uh, you know, even downward facing dog in the face of, of, of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome may not be the place where you start. There are some resources out there. If I remember correctly, there's a woman uh, who's a really excellent yoga therapist person in uh, New York City. Um, her name is escaping me, so I'll talk to Tanya afterwards and get it on the website uh, because she's developed uh, some yoga uh, DVDs and explanations specifically for people with carpal tunnel syndrome because she was in the area she was working. There were so many uh, people who were developing it, so she developed a, a a series of yoga postures that go from sort of gentle wrist movements and breathing and relaxation because that's the key with carpal tunnel syndrome is to figure out how can you get the muscles in your forearms to stop being so tense and how can you, uh, uh, you know, get more relaxation in there as well. Anyway, I'll find her name and uh, get Tanya to post that because uh, there's, there's definitely yoga for carpal tunnel syndrome uh, information and guidance out there. What are your thoughts on taking pain medications so that you can start to participate in yoga? Okay, so being a physical therapist, uh, I have limited capacity with medication question. However, what I would say is if you're taking pain medication, uh, it would be the wisest thing for you to do is to talk to your doctor um, or physical therapist or someone about this so that you know, they can, because uh, different pain medications are going to do different things. Some of them make you feel dopey, um, and so you know you're a bit of a risk when you're trying to do things. However, anything whatsoever that takes pain from a, a severe, a sort of moderate to severe pain level that then allows you to be able to be more active um, is fantastic. Um, and I know there are very, very you know there are varied situations around this, but it's a, a sort of a key component of good pain care from the healthcare professional system is we want to try to find things to get your pain down to a low enough level that you can do the things that you need to do to get better and that's an a excellent way to use uh, medications. If they get you to the spot where you can move then that's exactly how we want them to work uh, much better than you know you can take the pain medication and it gives you a sense of peace and relief and if you just uh, lay there, well, nothing's changing down the road, whereas if the pain can come down lower, and then you can be more active in a safe manner, it's the perfect thing to do. But definitely talk to, talk to your healthcare people about it for your individual uh, decision on this. Okay, I think we're going to have to actually stop there. We're right at noon. So um, I'm glad everyone was able to join us. Uh, Neil, thank you very much for your answers and for your insight. It was a very wonderful session. I think we had some very good questions um, related to this practice.